I have yet another interview for you all. This is with Alexander Adams, who is an art critic and an artist who pings between Germany and Britain. He speaks very fine British. I don't know about his German, but he's very articulate within the language that I'm articulate somewhat within. And we speak about basically identity politics and how it has invaded the art world, specifically in Britain. He's got some great insight and he brings a British perspective on what is multiculturalism and the problems with multiculturalism as he sees it. So here you go. A uh, lo long time watcher of your videos and great admirer of your hats. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to do with them. Should I keep on going with them or put them away? Because one of my trusted advisors says that I, I need to boost up my uh, reputability and cut out with the hats so I can get bigger names on my channel and stuff. So I, I don't know. I'm kind well, of wrestling. I, I think I think as long as as long as they're seeing the interviews without hats, I think oh. they know that you're you know. <laughs> You, you'll treat them credibly. Yeah, right. So what's what's your position in the art world or, or your history? Um, I'm an artist and art critic, and I've been involved in the arts uh, ever since I went to college at Goldsmiths College. Painting or sculpture, or what did you specialize in? Well, I, uh, my course was fine art and history of art. Hmm. So half of the time you were studying the history of art and writing about the great authors and uh, the great artists. And hmm. then the other half you were producing your own art. So that was the fine art half. Um, it sounds like a, an ideal recipe for producing great balanced artists, but unfortunately it tended to paralyze a lot of people because they were very, uh, they were sort of crushed by the grandeur of art and then mm. having to go into the studio and make their own art. So. Yeah, did, did you feel that way yourself or were you able to navigate that? Um, uh, I think I, I coped okay. Um, we had some quite strenuous, um, stressful group uh, criticisms hmm. where um, in some ways, in, in retrospect, they do resemble some of those group criticism sessions of uh, Stalinist uh, Russia and Maoist China, where you had the artists defending their art. And if the group took against you, you were sort of, um, hmm. you were harangued slightly and cool. forced to sort of confess your sins. And is that when you saw the uh, the tensions in the art world? Is that where you first witnessed uh, identity politics yes. corrupting things? Yeah, yeah. yeah very much, yeah. Was identity uh, politics a way to get around the, in, uh, the the mediocrity of one's skill, do you think? Or is that ungenerous? Um, no, I, I think that a lot of people, they were sort of searching for their identity at that time. And you don't have a great deal of life experience. So the, one of the first things you go to is uh, your identity. Hmm. And so you had a lot of artists who were sort of talking about the black experience, the female experience, the lesbian experience, and so on and so forth. Hmm. Um, but you said, but you got to notice that there were certain identities that were more privileged than others. So, for example, um, there was a girl uh, at college who was a Christian artist, and uh, she got a bit more flack than some of the other artists. And I think, in retrospect, I feel a bit guilty that I didn't sort of stand up more for her and say, well, actually, you know, this is just um, not your preference, you know, as a group. But I think that you should perhaps, uh, you know, respect her rights. Uh, but I didn't do that. In retrospect, I feel that way. Yeah. Um, do you, are you in contact with her now? Have you seen her develop? Continue? No, I haven't. I've, I've sort of looked for her name online. She may have married, so she may have changed her name. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it would be, be nice to sort of uh, sort of extend a hand of friendship and say, you know, I'm apologi I apologize that I wasn't perhaps a little bit more robust on your behalf. I hear you. So you have this I, against identity politics in arts and programming. Um, this statement is your your name is on here. That it's signed by. Yes, I'm people. I'm the top signatory. This this appears in uh, the Jackdaw, uh, okay. which is um, periodical in Britain, um, based on the arts, um, and it's broadly critical of what we call state art, which is the art which is sponsored by the public state, um, hmm. public funding. And we have this uh, statement, which I drafted and which has been signed by um, a lot of people. And we're republishing it in every issue oh. uh, with new names, with new names added. 
uh, and we're hoping to attract more names in the arts, uh, especially artists, art collectors, art dealers, art historians, and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to, you want to do the intro or the? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we, the undersigned, have been concerned by the rise of identity politics in arts programming, arts policy, and critical attitudes towards the arts. Identity politics is a system of beliefs which prioritizes surface characteristics of creators and consumers of art above the content of art. It is a dehumanizing set of beliefs which divides people along racial, ethnic, gender, sexuality, religious, and other lines. Mm. It demeans creators and consumers of art and encourages production of art that lacks the subtlety, ambiguity, and richness of which art is capable. Mm. We oppose identity politics and affirm the following principles. And there's uh, six bullet points after that. And is it sparking a lot of discussion or controversy? Uh, well, we're hoping that we're going to get a bit more press uh, coverage. Um, we've got some people in the uh, in sort of uh, quarterly magazines and so on, and we've got some people in, in the newspapers who are interested. And we're hoping that we're going to get the word out and get this sort of covered a bit more prominently, um, mm -hmm. because I think it's uh, essential that the public realize that um, a lot of the stuff that they're seeing in arts programming is not supported by many people who are involved in the profession. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, what, what's at stake then? There, is there like a, a certain narrative that has taken hold of what gets produced and shown? And yes, you guys want to break yeah. that? Or yeah, do you want to break that or recenter it on uh, another set of values? Well, uh, there's two ways of doing it. You can either say that, well, art should politics should largely withdraw from art or since this is publicly funded the arts should uh, reflect the wide scope of the political beliefs of the whole population not just uh, the liberal middle class people mm -hmm. because you've got so much art which is promoted which is very left leaning so you've got lots of stuff in, in favour of multiculturalism uh, sort of variety of faiths um, very sort of pro-feminist very pro-gay mm -hmm. um, and so forth and there's nothing wrong with that but then you say well actually I'd like to hear a bit more variety I'd like to hear from the artists who are very pro-Christian and celebrating the Christian heritage of Britain and what about those artists who are critical of multiculturalism uh, what about traditionalists what about people who are conservative uh, what about people who are skeptical about transgenderism and so forth mm. where is that art it's certainly not represented in the public venues that I've seen mm -hmm. well let's let's look at this bullet point number one mm. art should be judged primarily on its intrinsic merit what is yeah. what is merit, and how do we how do we evaluate that? What, how do we initiate the discussion you, to uncover that? Yeah, well, you, you've you've kind of got to the heart of um, aesthetics and judging art, mm. and unfortunately, in a manifesto, you can't really get into a detailed aesthetic discussion. But yes, you're right; it's very difficult to, to uh, tease out what you would call intrinsic merit. Um, I would say that you would. This would be largely along aesthetic, um, primarily aesthetic, and then secondarily historical grounds. Um, but everyone's going to have different viewpoints. I think the point is that as soon as you get in into too much of a detailed discussion of this point, then you're going to lose signatories. You're going to find people are going to say, "Well, I don't subscribe to a purely aesthetic." Okay. Um, way of looking at art but hmm. unfortunately you have to summarize things in bullet points so. yeah but how do this is like the the first commandment though so it's got to have you know like i am the lord thy god you know and like <laughs> what does god mean you're like well don't Everything talk about that <laughs> Uh, well, I, my definition of art is um, a non-utile physical object which can be appreciated primarily for aesthetic reasons detached from the context of its creation. Hmm. And now, uh, that, does, that doesn't necessarily factor into how people respond to it and the criteria they use for assessing the worth of art, but that's my definition of art. 
And by aesthetic, can can you we open up that little tiny can of worms? Like, what is that? Is that like an emotional response, a physiological response? A it, it, it could be all of those things, but it's based primarily on one's response to the visual content of the art. So that necessarily right. raises the further question of what is conceptual art, and my response is, well, conceptual art is technically not covered by this definition, and I wouldn't class it as art. But again, that's not the sort of thing that you put in this uh, bullet yeah. point. Because you want was, people who use conceptual uh yeah, because I, I think there are people uh, you, who would argue the point and they would argue that, well, you know, uh, the idea is an, an integral part of the aesthetic mm -hmm. um, and the intention of the artist is important. I would say, well, perhaps not. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I mean, I think that's a, that's a value judgment and it doesn't necessarily invalidate any of the other points. Mm -hmm. And by merit, I mean, is it tied also to... There, there's got to be some form of quality there and by quality i mean like a value and how do we assess the value because when i when i wrestle with this question i think that i think of of writing or of any art as a concentration of attention right so somebody has has labored over this this thing and whether or not like the actual moment of creation took one second or you know five five years it still they concentrated their attention into to make it valuable they packed it in there somewhere and and that concentration of attention is m married or is followed through on with skill with some sort of skill and that skill can be it doesn't necessarily mean that you sweated th through the whole thing you can be inspired and and just have a, a natural propensity for skill but th those two things uh are how i how i anchor that the the problem of Every, art is subjective, like that complete explosion. Um, the, the two things that are harmed in saying that all art is objective is that, oh, well, I don't need to work at this, and I don't need to think about this. I don't need to like actually engage with what I'm doing. I can just do whatever. And then that opens the doorway to how do I connect with the audience? Well, I'll use identity politics to connect with people. Instead of the primary non-utilitarian aesthetic experience, you're using all this, all this other stuff. Um, and it's, I, I don't know, what is, what's left? Well, there? I mean, you've, you've got sort of symbolism and iconography and so forth. I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of levels that you can use mm. and you've got sort of narrative as well, because, you know, you have, you have narrative painting where you have to tell a story and, you, you know, you're sort of presenting it in a way that your audience can read it visually. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I would also say that the artist, a part of the artist's work is also judgment. It's knowing what level of skill to apply, uh, knowing when to sort of define something very in a very detailed way and, and other times when you're defining it in quite a loose way. And by, you know, de so, by defining, you mean like in the art itself or oh yeah, speaking in, about... In the art. I mean, oh. in, in your applicate, in, you know, you're, you're deciding what level of skill and what level of clarity and information to present in each aspect of the art. And your judgment tells you what is the most effective thing. Because you'll find that if you look at something like a Vermeer painting, people think that Vermeer is a very detailed artist. Well, actually, what he's doing is doing a lot of suggestion. Mm -hmm. You look closely and he's actually suggesting a lot and your mind is reading a lot into it. But he hasn't actually put a great deal of detail. He's just been able to imply a lot. Hmm. But yeah, I, one story I, I was I found myself in Vienna one day and I was going through the uh, museum there and I turned a corner and there was a mirror and it was just on an easel in the corner of the room and like it just felt like my eyes were licking at like a chocolate bar. It was just so gorgeous and I never experienced that in any prints of his any book is that, that, that's the that's the painting of the artist in the studio isn't it I believe so. yeah it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful painting and a lot of that is it's so rich and dense but you actually you get close and you see that a lot of it is um, hmm. suggestion or uh, it's a reflection of the, the sort of the optical devices that he used so hmm. it's in a way it sort of prefigures impressionism that he doesn't describe a lot that he but he's doing is um, He's indicating it through um, relatively uh, well 
judged but not detailed uh, signs mm -hmm. in your own artistic journey do you find that you uh, utilize narrative the narrative is one of the things that you were warned off when you're at art college because uh, narrative was the great enemy of modernism and modernism was the prevalent um, ideological viewpoints that was just being seeded to postmodernism as we were studying at Goldsmiths. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, Goldsmiths is, in its own genteel English way, um, a rival for Evergreen College uh, level of madness because you, you heard about you heard about the LGBT plus society of Goldsmiths sending out a series of tweets. Oh yeah, yeah, I did the gulag. discussing how sending how sending. <laughs> Feminists to uh, gulags in the Soviet style would it be a compassionate way of re-educating them? I thought I thought that was that was that was almost peak stupidity. There. Well, no, I yeah, think, that I was... think we've, we've rivaled you. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they at least took it down. I think they took it down, right? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. But I think it's interesting that it's not necessarily a reflection of the fact that they don't feel that that's a reflection of their beliefs. It's just a reflection of, well, we got a lot of flack over this. Um, okay. It might yeah. be wise to take it down. I know that not all trans transgender activists think that, but mm -hmm. um, some certainly do. And I think that's the mindset that was driving the person, the individual who was writing yeah. those tweets. I wanted to broach the topic of, of narrative being the enemy of modernism. And how did that, do you think that that precipitated postmodernism? And could you, can we define what modernism is and postmodern um, from your well, conception? Okay, well, modernism and postmodernism are sort of. Uh, well, modernism about. has two has two strains in it. Modernism has the sort of the rational uh, enlightenment, progressive, uh, socially orientated strand. It also has the romantic, irrational, illogical, surrealist element. Uh, so you have these two parallel strands. I've always contended that the strongest strand is the Enlightenment, progressive, socially um, socially orientated strand, um, which is sort of quite reductionist. I mean, it leads to abstraction. So you have um, Mondrian, and then you've got sort of Malevich with the white square on the white background and so forth. And I've always thought that that's the predominant strand. And but, but both strands are very anti anti narrative because the narrative was seen as sort of a holdover of the traditional academic salon painting, and they were both opposed to that. Um, Postmodernism comes in in sort of around sixty eight seventy I think, mm -hmm. and I've always and I characterise uh, postmodernism as not something that comes after modernism, but more reaction to modernism. I always see it as a kind of a decadent anti modernism. Uh, in that it's to do with breaking up styles, breaking up uh, the idea of, of sort of coherence. So you would end up with something like a sort of mix and match, uh, dressing up box of styles and influences and, and ideas, um, which I think fundamentally un undermines the idea of um, art as, as a continuation, as a, as a logical progression and improvement, which is what a lot of the rationalist modernists considered. The postmodernists see it in completely the reverse. Uh, so they, they how, reverse in reverse how to, to progress, like a breaking uh, well, down of the things? In, in, well, in the sense that they see, they, 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 they discuss um, progress and consensus as being a sort of, as being a lie which, uh, which covers over the power politics of, um, yeah. uh, of, yeah. of class and race and so forth. Yeah. And then in the end, that's all you have left is power and politics. Yeah, well, right. according to the postmodernists, um, un unfortunately, I think it's extremely destructive, and I think that's what feeds identity politics. And when identity politics feeds into arts programming, because in I think what we'll get to later is the way that arts politics has uh, influenced the funding of art and uh, the the focus of art in public spaces in Britain and more widely. So, why is it destructive? What's destructive about that? Uh, well, it's incredibly divisive, it's tribal, and also once you've introduced um, um, politics into art and you say that everything is political, then nothing is personal. You have no private space for reflection, you have no private space for uh, mm -hmm. forming personal attachments. If you, you know, we've had cases where people have said, uh, you know, people have said that they're very interested in uh, traditional art. Or in landscape painting, and this is the thing that they like most, and they're regarded a little bit as a little bit suspect because, of course, 
if you're traditional, then you're kind of not in not really on board with urban art and mm. multiculturalism and modern things and urban life and immigrants because immigrants don't tend to live in the countryside and the mm. countryside is a little bit seen as unchanging which is just not true but it's seen as unchanging and stable and, and very um, sort of a, as a heart of patriotic pride well you know so if you're if you're if you're interested in that then essentially you're a patriot and you're opposed to change and opposed to urbanization and multiculturalism and so on so even having a preference for traditional art is seen as opposition to postmodernism and progressive politics hmm. because um, everything to them is a struggle somehow or um well, it's 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 you're, you're sort of you're revealing your political preferences through your art yeah. because if everything is political, then you, your aesthetic, your so-called aesthetic choices are not aesthetic at all. They're actually it's a it's a revel it's a revelation of your political underlying political beliefs, and you're an essentially a sort of uh, a traditionalist, a conservative. You're anti-change. Uh, you know, even even if it's just you know the fact that you prefer still lights and landscapes to figure paintings. Yeah, uh, and and when I saw that, I saw that at college. You know, even you know that we had one one girl who was very interested in painting landscapes, and she was a very good landscape painter. I think she was at the wrong school, <laughs> okay. unfortunately. But and 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 she got she got so much flack for just the simple fact that she was um, very bonded to this particular landscape where she had grown up and where her fa her family lived. Um, and she painted that, and she was sort of hauled before these courts, these inquests, and forced to account for why she had this preference for this unchanging, so-called idyllic life, uh, agricultural, sort of rural life, and why she wasn't engaging properly with the new ideas and the, 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 the tenets of postmodernism. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I, I feel very guilty that I didn't sort of stand up in those group meetings and say, this is perfectly good painting. It's just not to your style. You know, please don't make it political. Please don't make it personal. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very good painting of its time. Is there something that anchors intrinsic merit in that personal creation? And is that problematic because then you have to deal with the intention of the author or the artist? Uh, well, I would personally not deal with the intention of the artist mm. generally because there are... Uh, because we, we we encounter this interesting area where we treat as art objects which were never intended to be art. So, for example, you have uh, West African fetishes, which are sort of sculptures, um, which are sort of have a sort of um, sort of religious function. Hmm. We consider them to be art or craft. They were never judged that way. They were judged to be tools. They were judged to be spiritual tools by the makers. And they were used in religious uh, ceremonies and so forth. They had a religious function. They were tools. But we treat them as art. So also you have things like the grave goods of the Cyclades, which we consider to be this wonderful, superb, clean, white marble carvings of figures. And we say, oh, these are beautiful aesthetic. Well, we don't know exactly what the authors intended, because I don't think that we don't have... We don't have any writing from the Cyclades culture, which was the group of islands in uh, the Mediterranean near Greece. Um, so we don't know what function they assigned to these. They may not have considered them art. They may have considered them uh, sort of fetishes or symbols or, or you know, some something that had sort of a practical use. Um, so therefore, we choose to discuss as art anything we view as art. It doesn't necessarily re necessarily relate to the author's intentions. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating. Uh, one of the first courses I did at Evergreen was was about uh, iconoclasm, which is the destruction of images. And so we did a lot of studying at the uh, kind of the Enlightenment turn in art um, and the rise of uh, the idea of the aesthetic. Because before that turn, it was just there was religious art and maybe there was adornment. Maybe it was just craft and fancy craft, but most of it was all in service of something else. Everything that was art, and I'm projecting, and please correct me, everything that, that we classify as art now was in service of something else. And then in that modern, that enlightenment turn, it became a thing in itself. And then we started to discuss and, and um, investigate pure aesthetics uh, or, or something that's that's not 
chained to in service to something else and then that that gives us a lot of freedom and then it, but it eventually that freedom eventually devolves into what we have now so i mean a, a lot of a lot of art originally came from uh, religious origins so the, the 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 still life was a vanitas it was essentially um sort of mm. fruits or flowers or stuff that was produced that was placed beside the madonna and child to indicate the transience of human life that became detached from the original function which was uh, adornment for a, a religious religious painting and then it became an individual subject in itself and then you had economic rise so suddenly originally you just had kings and the church that were commissioning art and they would essentially commission either portraits or religious devotional images for the wider population or it would be private act of devotion and then once with the rise of the middle class and the artisans um, the, the, the merchants though you had the rise of uh, the different genres so you had private religious pictures you had portraits you had still lives and then later on you had landscapes and so forth um, and yes yeah, so, so it a lot of a lot of that it all comes from the religious communal aspect of art mm -hmm. yeah. in in a certain way i wonder if identity politics or the insertion of identity politics into art right now and, and how for however long it's been going on is a um uh, an unconscious returning of the sacred use of art or uh, the the sacred value to art by making it mean something sacred like this is in service of our highest ideal and our highest ideal is equality equity fairness justice and so we're putting art in service of that um i not necessarily i would say that you okay. talk to if you look at the art of like mondrian for example you think oh it's very clinical actually uh, mondrian was a theosophist um so he was interested in the sort of overarching connection between different religions and you had also lots of abstract art which is classed in terms of uh, cosmology and becoming and you know a sort of uh, display of the um, macroverse in the microverse. So, for example, you look at uh, Jackson Pollock painting, you're seeing something which is uh, an expression of, of sort of order and also chaos, and it's reflective of not only sort of very tiny things, sort of atoms bouncing around, but also of the stars of galaxies. And he yeah. has a painting that's called Galaxy, for example. So there's this idea of connecting with the grand and the mm -hmm. spiritual. So I would say that... Uh, Modernism is, is, of course, contradictory. So in one sense, it's quite materialistic and utilitarian, but it also has a strong spiritual basis. And someone, an artist mm -hmm. like uh, Mark Rothko, very spiritual artist, uh, you know, from your neck of the woods, I think. I would say that a lot of the identity politics in art comes from partly a social factor, but also uh, an economic factor. Because if you have galleries and museums and arts bodies which are encouraging identity politics and funding it they are encouraging artists to follow this path because there are rewards mm -hmm. what we have in uh, the arts is a huge oversupply of artists there are far more artists than there are art collectors so the art market has an oversupply of artists and in order to make any mark at all you know, if you're one of these thousands of art graduates who come out of art schools every year, mm. how are you going to distinguish yourself? So you're going to leverage your either political slant, left wing, of course, or you're going to leverage your uh, identity characteristics. And that will lead you onto the, the state art, public art uh, gravy train. Mm -hmm. So it's partly an economic situation. Why is it being funded by that? What's the origin of the funding then? Why are people... Uh because the people in, well, it's quite complex, but part of it is that the people who are in positions of power in the art system um, are left-leaning, they're liberal, uh, they're socially liberal, they're politically left, they're in favor of multiculturalism, there's a lot of women there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have been through college recently or university, and they are not trained so much in art history they are partly trained as arts venue managers mm -hmm. or they have been through new criticism which is critical theory so queer mm -hmm. theory black theory post uh, post-colonial studies you know all that mm -hmm. and so they they are consider themselves to be activists and political animals they are going into the arts 
organizations, the arts funding organizations, and thus they're in a position to reflect their political beliefs in the art that they are promoting. The problem is that you've got a sort of a political monoculture which has established itself yeah. in the arts mm -hmm. programming and in arts education. My response is I think that it's very difficult to get the art, the politics out of art once it's in, sadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, it, it reminds me of, uh, there was this guy named George W. Bush, uh, he was president of America, like in the two, 2000s, and um, he did this whole thing where he like wanted to invade this country called Iraq, and he just kind of did it. And he got the whole thing running and America and I, I think your country too. We just like, we just went into Iraq and fucked shit up and got fucked up in the process. Um, and there was a lot of protests against this war. And I was a part of the, I wasn't really a part of the protest, but I was really against that war. I felt it was incredibly unjust, incredibly stupid. And I just, I realized at some point, I'm like, this had already been going on for 20 years the whole we cannot stop this this has already been in motion for 20 years and what i kind of feel like with the identity politics is that it has taken root in these places and has for a couple decades it's just now it's reached yeah. critical mass where it has power and you can't just like swat it out they, they played the game correctly they got into yeah. the education system and then stacked up these other institutions it's it's uh, i mean some people have, uh, have called it infiltration i wouldn't call it that so much. I've in March. I have a book being published called um, "Culture War: Art, Identity, Politics, and Cultural Entryism," and I see it as essentially a, a system of cultural entryism into the arts, into administration, into the academic sphere. But I don't think it's coordinated. I think it's just simply people moving in parallel because they have similar goals, they have similar interests, um, they're attracted to the arts, they're, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. The, they're so they're, wo they're working too. in power. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they and they believe in, in utopias. They believe in just a little bit more engineering, just a little bit more tinkering, just a little bit more um, diversity and uh, representation and so on. And then things will be perfect. Of course, they'll never be perfect. But, yeah. Yeah. That, that's that's what's driving them all. They don't need to have uh, any sort of uh, connection between each other. They just work in parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it's necessarily a conspiracy. It's just, but, but I do think that it, it's the development of something that was set in motion a long time ago. And it, whatever this thing is, I don't think it's a conscious entity. I think it's kind of like the some sort of. Uh, uber meme like just this this collection of uh, evolutionarily de designed ideas that that have just kind of slowly rolled through culture and stuff and so when we go up against it i think it it's smart of us to to look at it as something that has a, a history and it has a momentum too and that there are ways to to uh not even necessarily fight against it but provide provide something else provide an alternative i mean there's two things you can do you can fight against it or you can show that there's something better right um yeah to fight the or, or, or you or you can join it and like they did try to sort of undermine it by yeah. by being objective and being interested in art history but because what's happened is you've got all these sort of activist graduates who, have, who are coming into the arts and the old sort of art historian types and curators uh, are retiring from their positions yeah. and they're being replaced by these new people who are essentially political animals and social activists and so on. I was part of a radio uh, program recently, a documentary, where you heard um, a young female artist saying that she essentially considered herself a social activist who just worked through the means of art. Mm -hmm. And so once you've got that and you've got that being supported by the arts administrators, you've got yeah. sort of a snowball effect. But you... You still have to be something other than an artist. I, I, I think that you still have to be something other than an artist. Like, oh yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. every well, 
you 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 hope that your writers and your artists and your cinema directors they have a full rounded life and they're doing other things apart from their 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 artistic concerns that they have a family life that they have some sort of interest in spirituality and history and so forth you want you want them to be rounded mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's sort of that's that's fine but I mean you do get some artists who are essentially um, hermits you know mm -hmm. and they're obsessed by art um, and that's not uncommon it does happen hmm. so uh i want i want to ask you what you mean by multiculturalism you've, you've brought that up several times and i i have a feeling it's slightly different in in your country it's, it has a slightly different definition could you define that for me and the, the problems of it and and why are the pluses and the minuses of it well i mean it's it's is to do with sort of the introduction of uh, non non indigenous British culture in in different forms. Um, I mean, it's always there's always been a degree of uh, variety in the British Isles. So you've got sort of Welsh culture. Even you've even got differences in Welsh culture, North Wales and South Wales, and uh, there's a Cornish identity and so forth. So there's been multiple identities, and you know we've had sort of uh, a lot of imp we've had. Uh, influence since the Roman times and so forth. Um, but I think that it's, the problem is when you get multiculturalism and you've got a state which believes in influencing culture mm. um, and it's sort of promoting, so it, it, all it's sort of, it considers the indigenous culture hostile, automatically hostile to other cultures. And so it starts to promote the other, the, 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 the new incoming cultures, and it starts to downgrade the indigenous culture. Hmm. And there's this sort of snobbery that you get um, in politics with, you know, you have elitism and you have um, the elite believing that um, uh, the general population are just too stupid and too racist. So, you know, if there's ever an, uh, um, an Islam, Islamist attack, that um, the people will just rise up and start murdering um, Muslims in the street and Hindus as well because they're, they're so racist they can't tell the difference and so forth. But in it, it's not true. I think Britain's very tolerant and uh, compassionate and sort of outward-looking country, and it's it's always been that way since you know since the trading period of the of the sort of the Middle Ages, and then you've got the sort of period of empire. So you had a lot of sort of cross-cultural influence and interest. Um, but there is there is this great uh, belief by the political class and the ruling class that the sort of that British people are, are inherently racist and that they can't be trusted, and this is why you often get things like sort of uh, where the the British government and the British police go into sort of the business of hate speech yeah. and that freedom of expression that they they just don't. Me. They just they just don't trust the British people to you know to laugh at racism to to say hey that's not very fair or that was rather cruel or you shouldn't have said that they they've forgotten about the social the social uh, policing of uh, racism and nationalism when it goes too far and you know and it does sometimes it's um, I, but they but they they've now legislated for it yeah yeah I see I, I there was a some sort of web page put out by a. Yorkshire, some police department. South, like, South Yorkshire Police yeah. Authority sent out a tweet saying they wanted people to report non-crime hate incidents. So they they clearly got all the burglaries and the rapes and the murders and the car thefts under control because now they've got time to investigate things that aren't even crimes. Yeah. So if someone looks at you wrongly in a supermarket or someone makes a sarcastic remark. That will now that can now be investigated, and they'll keep a record of that, and they'll mm -hmm. use that against you. In future. And even if even if that person feels like you were being yeah. sarcastic, yeah, I mean the, the word the wording of our the wording of our um, hate speech laws in the Communication Act and the Public Order Act, I think, is so vague that it just comes down to if you feel offended, and in fact, it, it comes down to um, if this could cause a person offence. So you don't even need to offend a person. You can just say, oh, this would probably offend a Jew or a Muslim. So, you know, so ipso facto, you've got a crime here. Um, and it's very, it's very serious. And it's 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 um, completely chilling public discourse because, you know, for example, with this um, 
the, this statement, this statement that we're circulating, um, I've got people saying they completely believe in it. They absolutely believe in it. They know that identity politics is absolute poison, but they can't put their name to this because they're going to be accused of being a, a racist or a, a, a bigot. It bothers me on, on a number of levels. The first is, I mean, it's so freaking Orwellian. And like, mm. have, have none of these people even read that book? I mean, it, it was written. No, it's, it's, it's so obviously insane and this this is just going to lead, lead to it's a thought it's thought policing yeah because it's it is not it's not to do with speech it's to do with thought it's this idea that we've got to prevent you from thinking bad things so therefore if we stop people saying bad things you won't think them mm -hmm. no. well uh, so well, it's, there's it's, that it's, level it's off to the re-education camps with us all yeah, exactly. It, there's that level of this government body policing things that, and, and I don't, well, one, I don't trust the government body to have like a, a very acute sense of language. I mean, they're a bunch of bureaucrats. They don't yeah. understand sarcasm, probably don't have much humor to begin yeah. with, you know, and you want those, those people in charge, the, the people who are going to end up in charge are the last people that you want in charge. You want yeah. people who I mean, the, are comedians, you know, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the judge who prosecuted, um, who found, who found, Count Dankula guilty said that context do context doesn't matter. It's an offensive statement. It doesn't matter if it was a joke. It doesn't matter if you found it funny. It doesn't even matter that it was a joke. Yeah. You yeah. are now guilty of uttering hate speech. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can't. And how can how can you fight that? And the, especially well, when it comes down to things like sarcasm or irony or parody or something. Good luck with that. Yeah. Even an outright joke, which was made by a comedian. On a comedy channel in a video in which he said my girlfriend is always ranting and raving about how cute and adorable her wee dog is and so i thought i would turn them into the least cute thing that i could think of which is an he actually explained it in the video <laughs> It, uh, this is the second uh, thing that worries me is that what is going to be the backlash of calling an entire populace uh, racist and and offensive and then every time they try to argue against you you just say, say use that as proof that they're even more and more racist like that is that not it's going to lead to a, a very bad situation yeah you're going to get the rise of um populist parties not just populist parties but extremist parties and you're eventually and those are probably going to get banned and so and eventually you'll reach a stage where you have violence violence by the state against people and violence by people against the state because mm -hmm. they, they they can no longer speak and 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 it, it seems crazy that we've gone from this situation of prosperity wealth um, the peace mm. in, in Western Europe. We've done very well. We've had an incredible run. Mm. And now we've managed to set ourselves up with our system, which is designed to tribalize us, which is, you know, through identity politics. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a government and an elite which says, well, we're going to uh, legislate for, for um, speech crimes and hate crimes and thought crimes. And then if you protest this, you are ipso facto be going to become considered uh, socially and politically abnormal, and we reserve the right to you know, correct your behavior. Is there any but way to read this as something other than absolutely malicious? Like, like in, uh, intentionally? Are, are these people being intentionally uh, no, malicious? No, no, no. I think I, you've, well, you've got to distinguish. There are a small group of people who are driven by absolute hatred, absolute resentment. They hate... The majority because they've been they've been given this all this stuff about sort of um critical theory they've been told that any uh, any majority group is necessarily oppressive yeah. and it uh, designs a system which is uh, designed to suppress the weaker and so they've got this burning sense of injustice and hatred and they're mm -hmm. fueled by resentment of the rich um resentment of of white people of traditional culture of christian culture of the sort of the, the legacy culture um, well, it even goes and to then, and resentment of skill, it resentment even, of skill, of actual skill, of talent. Yeah. Like, like it yeah. breaks down that anybody who's better than me is necessarily oppressing me. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got that core group of yeah. of people who are driven by hatred and anger, and then you've got a large body of well-meaning people who feel well. 
maybe there is underrepresentation. You know, may, maybe we should get people, you know, maybe there is a, some sort of legacy of slavery or, or misogyny or patriarchy. May, maybe we should, you know, do some nice things to help things. You know, maybe we should balance things up. It, it looks a bit odd that we don't have 50% of, of female artists in this museum collection. Maybe we should rise, you know, raise the level of women there. And they, they, they genuinely think they're doing good things and they genuinely think they're benefiting things, but they don't realise that they're playing into politics and tribalism and it will reach a stage, you know, where you have um, people who oppose them and, and they say, well, why are you opposed to, are you opposed to women? Are you opposed to black people doing well? Are you opposed yeah. to, you know, Muslims having you know, exhibitions in these museums and so forth? Mm -hmm. yeah. And how do you counter that? How do we counter that? I, it, how is this uh, statement designed to counter that? By giving I people think it's, something to stand on? or Yeah, it's, 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 a sort of, it's a set of principles that you, you can stand on against uh, against this sort of tribalism and against identity politics it might not change anything but i think it's you, it, it's a matter of principle just to stand up and say look this is so destructive this is so demeaning and this is terribly demeaning to the artists who are benefiting think think you know all women artists now who go into a, who, are, who are bought by a museum people are going to be looking at their work and they're going to be saying wow it's probably there just to fill a quota Mm -hmm. And that's that's terribly that's that's terribly demoralizing, and it's patronizing for the viewers as well. Mm -hmm. It's patronizing that they're being given second-rate art because um, you know they they, they can only re they can only respond to art made by a black person or a woman. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what comes down to the, the the finessing the sort of sinister finessing of the demographics of the audience, not yeah. just the artist but the audience. Yeah. Which yeah. is uh, yeah. one of these. Um, points on the list you, they're gonna so, eventually try to establish quotas of appreciation like if you love yeah. this thing you also have to love this thing or yeah. else you're not fair yeah um, um, and the, you have this uh, and you have this lie that happens in public funding um, where you talk about oh we want to we want to make art inclusive and we want to you know, have more black people and more minorities and more poor people come to galleries because they don't come. But actually, the truth is, um, and I will show you this book, uh, which is called um, Why Are Artists Poor? It's a fascinating book by a Dutch academic. And he suggests that, that one of the principal reasons that the arts funding is so geared towards targeting minorities and the underprivileged and so-called the so-called marginalised, is actually nothing to do with actually reaching those communities. It's because the elite are actually the major consumers of public art. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones that go to the galleries. They're the ones that go to the theatre. They're the ones that go to the ballet and the opera and so forth. And they want their hobby and their pastime subsidized by the state hmm. but the only way they can justify it to themselves is by saying well actually it's to do with outreach it's to do with inclusion hmm. when even after great programs of inclusion and so forth that a lot of poor people have got no interest in fine art and high culture at all hmm. and i would say well okay that's their choice that's not necessarily a bad thing but don't you middle class people who are talking about inclusion put this put out this line about oh it's to do with oh it, in bringing in marginalized groups it's mm. not it's to do with you getting your hobby funded by the taxpayer mm. and, and and supplementing it uh, on a on a virtue level of like making sure that your aesthetic appreciation actually has a, an effect in the world yeah and it's obviously and also you you've got to include your politics in this in this uh, in in the in the art in the culture that you're promoting as well, you mm -hmm. couldn't possibly because the, for example I've said you couldn't possibly have a play you have a play um, denouncing patriarchy and and and, and talking about the, the disgusting effects of capitalism that that would be you know very common in a in an arts funded in a publicly funded venue in Britain, but you find a play which is about uh, you know about about working class people resenting um, Muslim immigrants. You'll never find that in a in a publicly funded space. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Even though that perhaps that play might be more worthy of public support, and it might because it might be more uncommon. Mm -hmm. 
than the sort of anti-capitalist play. Yeah, and it, and it might it would never. It might, in effect, uh, bring life to or, or render the characters of everybody in that situation in such a way that that it would actually educate people on the huma common humanity that we all yeah. share. And actually, a play like, you know, talking about a sort of a working class response to Muslim immigration would actually form a bond between middle class and working class people. So they might actually get to sort of see um, mm. what, what a lot of working class people are, are feeling and thinking on the matter. Hmm. Um, so it might that, that might actually be inclusive. You might actually getting uh, get a lot more working class people into see a play like that than a play that's saying you know smash the patriarchy and isn't capitalism terrible? Well, what's what's concerning to me and what we've seen happen, especially over this last year, maybe two years, is that the uh, on YouTube, for example, and just through the internet, a lot of independent creators, independent artists, are finding an audience, are finding enough money to like eat and maybe buy better equipment and now the uh the the media is uh, I, I don't know if i should say the elites or not but but this the group that has been controlling culture is starting to get more and more worried about this and starting to attack it on a very variety of levels count Dan dankilo was just open we're going to judge you we're going to take you to court but then there's the this report that was released earlier this week that had this chart of like different youtube people that may have talked to each other and I, these I are all that. Yeah, they, these yeah. are all radicals. The, and then, yeah. and then that, that story, even if it's horribly sourced, it's well written. It's a very well written document. Horribly mm. sourced, though, if you actually look at it, that document's now being used by the Guardian, being used by you know all these big yeah. papers, and it, and it will be used well, by the BBC. And, yeah. You know. And and you know and and Tim Paul has said you know half half of the people he's connected to he's never had any 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 interaction with so it's actually factually inaccurate and it, all, it leaves off all the nodes that are left wing the left wing people who are part of this commentariat oh yeah uh, who have been invited in to give talks and so on and you know and it and they're completely excluded because of course you know they're only targeting the people they perceive as right wing yeah. uh, who are actually a variety of people who are sort of moderates liberals. Some alt right, some some conservatives. It's it's just a bunch of people that threaten them. Yeah. Because of the audience, because they're actually reaching out, and they don't have to go through the filters of these institutions. They don't have to go through the pockets of the bureaucrats to to survive. You know, so they can create whatever they want, and then, and the thing is, is that if you just let that happen, I mean, I. I if you just let that happen, good ideas will happen. It's just like you, you have like this free marketplace and then the best ideas are going to emerge. And, and the bad ideas, the toxic ideas, they will be able to, will actually be able to see their causes, their effects, and, and we will be able to see th their roots much clearer than if we just have this government body saying, okay, we think this might be evil, therefore you're going to jail for gulag time. You know, five, no more than 10 years though, or 25, you know. Yeah. But, but, you know, in the Gulag, you know, the, as, as you'll have seen from the tweets, the maximum was ten, only 10 years. Only 10 years in Siberia in these re-education camps. That, that, I mean, I might actually volunteer for that. Myself. Yeah, I know, right? It's like cl Club Med. I mean, yeah, you're totally taken care of. Yeah. Hmm. So, so you got a book coming out next year. Yes, the big book is out in March. And there will be a big. Uh, I think uh, that's going to get a lot of reviews. Oh, good, good. Are you are you planning a tour of some sort? Of uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to be doing a sort of. There's going to be a launch and a book signing. Uh, if I'm invited to talk at universities, if they feel brave enough, uh, mm. I'd be very happy to come and give talks, uh, give signings, and discuss um, the subject of the book, which is um, cultural politics. Um, free speech, uh, the effect of um, public policy in the arts, um, also the idea of reparations or restitution of artwork from museums hmm. to um, origin countries. Um, mm -hmm. So it covers quite a broad spectrum. You know what? All you need is a protest. We should look into getting you a protest. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I. I think if I went to talk at Goldsmiths, my old college, we could get like a, a mini Berkeley riots going if, if people just are interested. a small one, very British. Yeah, just, yeah, I mean, you can wear bowler hats and drink tea and say, down with that sort of thing. <laughs> and then, yeah, like the, throw the teacup on the ground or something like that. Absolutely, they can throw Battenberg cake at me if they want. Uh, <laughs>
That, that, that would be that would be very welcome. That would raise my profile. Yeah, exactly. That's what hey, I'm thinking. Goldsmiths, Goldsmiths, call me. Call me. <laughs> <laughs>